Are you a designer, collector, or creator of the treasure trove of unique props and memorabilia? Well, it's time to turn your collection into cash. If you have props, costumes, set pieces, crew gifts, or any other type of memorabilia, Prop Store wants to put your items center stage in their upcoming Los Angeles live auction. It's located right outside of Los Angeles, Prop Store is the leader in online auctions and sales of authentic memorabilia from movies, TV, and entertainment. And the best part is that Prop Store will handle all the logistics for you. From valuing your items to marketing, reaching potential buyers worldwide, they've got you covered. It is an incredible opportunity to turn your inventory into profit. Just go to propstore.com slash sell. That is propstore.com slash sell. And let Prop Store make your memorabilia shine just as brightly as it did on screen. Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the one-stop shop for actors and creators both above and below the line. I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, Backstage Senior Editor and Professional Entertainment Obsessive. I'll be your guide through every corner of the creative industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. Here you'll find intimate, in-depth talks with today's most award-worthy names in film, television, and theater. Along the way, we'll get advice on living your best creative life, relatable stories of the highest highs and lowest lows, and maybe, just maybe, a rare peak in the envelope. Because I know a lot of film and TV actors who show up and they barely know their lines but they have tremendous talent that can be incredibly live in the moment. And once they get that one performance on film, they don't have to ever do it again. Not so with theater, you have to do eight shows a week. So you're not gonna have always that magic that you might have had on that one day of filming. And welcome to another episode of In the Envelope, the Actors Podcast. I am your host, backstage senior editor, Vinnie Mancuso. And joining us today is the truly, truly wonderful Constance Wu. Now, anyone who knows Constance primarily from her incredible on-screen roles in Fresh Off the Boat or Crazy Rich Asians or Hustlers uh, might not know that she is a theater actor through and through, uh, dating back to doing community theater in her hometown of Richmond, Virginia, through her BFA at SUNY Purchase, uh, all the way up to now, as she co-stars as Audrey in the long-running off-Broadway revival of Little Shop of Horrors. And with that role, she's actually fulfilling a lifetime dream. Uh, Audrey, of course, a kindly and insecure florist shop co-worker to Seymour, uh, in this case played by Corbin Blue. That has been Constance's bucket list role for her entire career. And she was so incredible and candid here, uh, explaining not only how she's approached this role she's been waiting to play for most of her life, uh, but also the long and winding road it took to make it here in the first place. Let's get right into it. Here is Constance Wu. Constance, how's it going? How are you doing? Great. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. It is a pleasure to meet you. Um, And especially under these circumstances, uh, you're in one of the greatest musicals of all time, uh, Little Shop of Ours. Um, (laughs) How exciting. Uh, you have a show tonight? I do have a show tonight, yeah. I have an 8 o'clock. I, I love talking to actors when they're on Broadway because that uh, is incomprehensible to me. Uh, having a show, talking to me right now, having a day, and then going on stage. So I do want to ask... Well, it's off-Broadway, first of all. It's not on-Broadway. That's, that's fair. Uh, no, honestly, any any stage. Any stage. <laughs> if you're performing in a bar, if you're performing in the park, any live theater, uh, the fact that someone can just go about their day and then do that at night. Uh, that's incredible to me. So I, I'm curious about your uh, show day routines, uh, how you sort of compartmentalize like life and the stage, um, how you like to you know sort of get ready, how you sort of like to live in between performances. What is your what is your show day uh, like? Well, you know, I grew up as a theater actor, and then I did film and TV for a very long time and didn't get to do any theater. So. 
now that I'm doing it again, but I'm a mother now, a mother of two, and one is one of my kids is an infant. It's very different than what my normal routine would be because a lot of it revolves around like breastfeeding and like taking my kid mm -hmm. to the to, to preschool, taking my other kid to preschool and stuff like that. So, um, but before when I was did not have kids, I used to um, make sure that I ate really well and balanced. I usually did yoga just to get my breath pretty deep. I usually did a Kristen Linklater type of warm up before a show and, um, you know, an Edith Skinner type of speech warm up as well. Now I'm doing a musical, which I, I studied classical theater in college. I didn't study musical theater, but I did musicals when I was young and it's a different Different ball game, man. I'll tell you. So I don't do the link later anymore. I do like a, a singing vocal warm up, which is like I found so necessary. It makes such a difference. My first ever two show day, which was a couple Wednesdays ago, that last Wednesday maybe, I made the mistake of going out between the matinee and the evening show with my best friend who was in town, and we were just gabbing over dinner. <laughs> and then that night I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Like, I don't know if I'm going to yeah. make it through suddenly Seymour. I don't think I can do it. And I did by <laughs> the skin of my teeth, but I really. You're just holding on. You're like, yeah, I really end. learned from that day that I, on two show days, I have to do vocal rest between shows. I cannot be gabbing with my girlfriends for hours, you know? So the next two show day I had, I did that. Exactly that. I did vocal rest between shows and then I was soaring totally fine. So, you know, this is a process for me learning how to do it too. You know, and then little things like if I have dairy, then I get a little bit more mucusy than I want. And that's not great for singing, um, you know, acid reflux, using like a, a steamer for my voice, all these things that I have to do to protect my vocal instrument, which for classical theater, you need to protect your instrument, but you can also still act if you have a slightly hoarse throat. Like mm -hmm. singing this show is not easy. So um, so I, I've had to adjust for that. It's interesting how much, how many of these lessons are sort of learned through um, not doing them, you know, like learning what not to do because you get to the show and you're like, wow, I should, I should never do that again when it comes to the dairy or it comes to the thing. Yeah, I, it's funny. So after the two show day that I where I made it by the skin of my teeth because I had been talking between shows. I asked our music director, Will, I was like, can I try it in the lower key? And he was like, at first, he was like, no, no, no. And we did. We tried it in the lower key for one performance just because he's like, OK, we'll try it for a week and see how you feel. I did it for one show. I immediately texted him afterwards. I was like, nope doesn't work. Let's go back to the original key. <laughs> I was go. like, you are right, Will. I'm sorry. You are right. Let's go back to the original key. And, um, and we did. Um, and it's just better. It's better in the original key. I can totally hit it. And it easily, as long as I don't talk for three hours between shows. Um, and it just sort of, it's just more exciting in the original key. So well, that audience, that one audience got something that uh, nobody else has ever heard. They got, they got that just um, I do, I do want to, um, you know, you mentioned that you you have a long life in the theater. Um, and I do want to sort of go back and then sort of chart the, the how you got to Little Shop, you know, the, everything along the way. Um, I think I've seen you say that, you know, you first started doing theater with, you know, Henrico Teen yeah. Theater in Virginia. Um, do you remember what the show was? Do you remember what your first 100%, time was? 100%. My very first audition was for a community theater production of A Little Princess, based on the book by Frances Hodgson Burnett. Nice. And my director for that was Becky Jones. I actually just had lunch with her a few months ago when I was back home in Richmond, Virginia. She's still a theater nerd like me. And um, I did a lot of shows with her, but, but A Little Princess was my very first one. And then mm -hmm. from that time on, I was pretty much always doing a play until... I graduated drama school and then I was just waiting tables. <laughs> Do you remember the, the, at what point it sort of went from like something you were doing, you know, theater is something you're doing to like something you're doing, <laughs> like something that you're like, oh, this isn't just a way to spend the time. This is like a goal. Uh, this is something I, you know, I want to. Uh... That's hard because um, everyone always wants to be like, is there a 
crystallizing moment? Is there an aha moment? And I don't think it's as clear cut as that. Um, I do know the first time I ever, I write about it in my book, my first audition for A Little Princess. It was the first time I felt that I wasn't being shamed for having big feelings. In fact, I was being valued for my big feelings. And I feel like as a kid, I always had big feelings and that can be really embarrassing. It's just really embarrassing to be the person who cries at the drop of a hat or somebody says, you're too loud or like stop harmonizing or whatever. And so it was always the place where I felt the most free and the most like myself. And it, there was never a moment where I'd be like, mom, dad, I'm going to be an actor or like, I'm going to, it was just always just like a given in a way in my family, the same way, like, yeah, you put shoes on before you go out the door. Uh, yeah, Constance is a theater person, obviously. So it was never like a permission thing. It just, it just naturally always went along with my personality. And I just, I just didn't really see any other choice. It's hard to imagine myself doing anything else. When I was like in my late twenties, I did briefly try to do another profession. I went back to school for like speech language pathology, but it's just like, I, I don't think there's anything else I could do. Although now actually, now that I have kids, I'm like, I feel like I would really like being a preschool teacher just cause I love kids, <laughs> love, especially toddlers. But yeah, there's no crystallizing moment. When I was writing my book, I realized that um, the only person who believed in me during this very traumatic middle school experience I had was my drama teacher. And I do think, in hindsight, I think that was a subconscious determining factor, but it wasn't like that teacher made me be like, all right, this is what I'm going to pursue. But it was, it was that teacher being the only one who had faith in me and the only one who believed me in a world of make-believe, right? that probably made it the most natural thing for me to do. And at any point did you, I, I know that there's no, um, like you said, there's no crystallizing moment where you're like, oh, my, my calling, I, I, will, I will start doing this. But is, was there any time where you started noticing yourself putting together your, you know, quote unquote process, you know, like how you're going to go about acting, you know, not, not like doing it as a profession, but like how you yeah. create characters, how you prefer to, um, prepare for these things is there anything or was it just something where you were like picking things yeah, up i think it's ever evolving and i think the second that i think this is my process and this is how i do it that's the second that i know i'm in trouble because that's when things become static and they're not adaptable and the biggest thing for me is always being able to be in the moment to be alive in the moment and the second something is set in stone like i have to say a line this way or I have to do that you sort of lose that aliveness and, you know, I went to drama school and we studied all, you know, we did all the Meisner repetition exercises, sense memory, you know, <laughs> we had, we did all the lexicon Shakespeare work. And so I did that. I actually think in a way that set me back a little bit, drama school kind of put me in my head about my work, which I think was important because it's good to have those kind of things, but it made me worse before it made me better. So I definitely took tools from that. But then with every new project I have, I run into different roadblocks and um, I've had to adapt and try different things and fail a lot, but be brave enough to fail in order to, to find my way in. I definitely find my way in in many different um, ways. You know, there are a handful of ways that I'm like, this often works, but it doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. And I have a great acting coach. His name's Craig Archibald. I feel like he's kind of my soulmate in art. And when I'm stuck, he helps me a lot. And then with singing, that's, uh, I have a coach named Eric Vitro and he's, he's great. And, um, he's been really helpful just in terms of like the instrument. Um, but like the emotional character preparation stuff, that's stuff that is continually evolving. And that's what's fun about it. I was actually just reading uh, the forward you wrote for uh, Craig's book, uh, The Actor's Mindset. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, his book. That's right. Uh huh. And you mentioned a note he gave you that I found really interesting, and I'd like, I'd love for you to sort of elaborate on because I, I found it so interesting. The note he gave to you is that um, you're watching yourself. You're watching yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and that sort of unlocks something for you. And I'm curious, and I'm, I'm sure people listening are curious, sort of, 
what that meant to you. Because it's one of those classic acting notes where you're like, well, I'm not sure what that means, but it's definitely means something. <laughs> it's definitely correct. Yeah. I mean, it was, I was hitting all the beats, hitting all the notes, doing all the things that I was supposed to do. I was being, quote unquote, a good little actor. And so because of that, even though I was hitting everything and even though in a conservatory drama school, like I probably would have gotten high marks, I wasn't fully in there because I was watching myself, congratulating myself, showing off a little bit like, oh, I understand the subtext behind this line. Oh, I understand what I need to do in the arc of this story. So it's a little bit of showing off. And when you get to that point, then it's not, it ceases being about the character and it's about you and what a quote unquote good job you're doing. And that's ego. That's not character. And I think, um, it has to cost a little bit more and it has to, um, it can't feed the ego. It has to kind of obliterate it because it's not about you. It's about this person. You're supposed to use your soul to help this person, this character, sing their life. Not the other way around. You're not supposed to use this character in order to show off what a great actor you are. That's ego, ego, ego. And I think what's hard is that, and I think it's a lifelong journey, is you can get caught in that trap pretty easily without realizing it, right? Because it's good to feel good about yourself and to be proud about your work. But like, it's just a very fine line between like confidence and ego. So yeah, that line, Craig, it's saying to me, you're watching yourself. It was such a simple way to articulate something that I just tried to articulate in like way too many words. But he did it. He hit it. The nail right on the head is you. I was watching myself. And that means that I wasn't fully in character. I was literally outside of myself, congratulating myself. And that's when I was like, oh, that's not what this is. And the fact that Craig was able to pick up on that so quickly um, is sort of what makes him my artistic soulmate. I love that. And it's it's interesting because it's sort of like, you know, a great performance. Great acting is not going to come from being very aware of how good of a job (laughs) you're doing because it's, you know, the character that's has nothing to do with the character's life. They don't, they don't, they don't know any of that. You know, it's, it's sort of like, you have to take all that learning and all the things you did at school and just absorb it. And then Throw it out the window, the kind of. Just trust that it's like in the marrow of your bones and just throw it out the window. But that's the problem with taking, going to drama school in a place where you literally are getting grades, you know, um, for something that mm-hmm. is so impossible to quantify. Um, I think that's, what I meant when I said that I think drama school made me worse before it made me better. That's very interesting. I I, I was looking, you know, sort of through your uh, in post graduation that some of the theater productions you've done uh, early in your career, and I I just want to sort of go through a couple yeah. and if you know anything you remember from them, where you were at the time, what you take away from it, what you wish you didn't wish wish you didn't take away with it. Uh, and the first one I sort of came across was um and the Earth Move. Oh yes, uh, which. Timothy Wong, you know, he, he, I saw on Instagram, he was very appreciative that you put that in. Yeah, your that was bio, my first show in New York. Uh, for Little Shop. Um, what, what, what was, you know, that mm-hmm. it was a musical, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what, where were you at that time? And sort of what were you taking away from your first, uh, your first show in New York? God, I was just glad to be doing such a great show in New York. I, you know, I was surrounded by such talented people. I, I, I remember actually feeling a little bit intimidated by how good everyone was i think there was this actress named lisa howard and it was like i think it was before she did putnam county spelling bee and like a bunch of stuff and like oh my god her singing voice was like so incredible like i was like oh my god i'm nothing compared to this lady and um same thing there was this other girl her name was melanie maypo and she was just oh my god phenomenal and it was just and it was mostly it was all asian american cast actually because it was about the earthquake in taiwan And it was just so wonderful being around Asian American actors at the top of their game. And then, but then I get, obviously I just like come out of drama school and I was feeling very intimidated because a lot of these people had done a lot of things, but I had a great time on that show. It was the New York Music Theater Festival, Nymph, which I don't think is in existence anymore. I could not, yeah, that's what it looked like to me. I could not find it. Oh, that's too bad. It was really fun. Um, Yeah, so that was my first um, post- 
post purchase. Purchase college is where I went to drum school. And then in 2005, you were doing The Tempest at the uh, Virginia Shakespeare Festival. Oh, yeah. That's one of your, uh, a few Shakespeare productions, I believe, you've been in. Yeah, I have been in a few Shakespeare productions. I was playing Miranda. That was really fun. <laughs> to be honest, that one felt a little bit like, you know, uh, like doing summer stock or something. It felt like, um, <laughs> you know, you do the shows and then you go out and you're like, getting drunk and like eating ice cream at like 3 a.m. and being like, let's watch the sun come up, guys. And then you do that and then you're like hungover. I, it was so fun, though. I'm still friends with a lot of people from that production. It's it's important to get those experiences. Oh, yeah. well. I think it's all. It's... Yeah, that's part of growing up. And part of growing up is a big part of, you know, being an actor. Yeah. You, you have to live a life to then bring other people's lives to life. 2006. Joe Bosk's Ping Pong uh-huh. Diplomacy at the, the the Winter Repertory Festival. At 59 um, East 59, was... Little Black Box. Yes, I, and I believe that's another thing. You know, those, I'm not sure that's, that's still, still around. That's still around. Um, is I it? think I recently followed them on Instagram and I was like, yeah, I'm glad that they're still around. I love that. And at that point, you were still doing theater in New York. You were still sort of uh, being a, a New York theater actor. Well, I was mostly waiting tables, but I was still regularly um, auditioning. You know, this is before the internet was like a thing. You didn't like, I mean, it was a thing, but you didn't like submit yourself online. Like yeah. you got, sometimes you got the paper version of backstage or you went to the equity chorus calls and things like that. Um, so I was still auditioning. I couldn't really, I didn't really get very many shows. The Virginia Shakespeare Festival doing the Tempest, um, that was like a regional show that I got. Um, and then Ping Pong Diplomacy was, it was based off of like a playwriting competition where they did these um shows and that was really sweet fast forward to 2022 and you know you do 222 a ghost story that kind of you know marked a return to the stage for you um and i you we had you on the cover of backstage in 2019 and you actually specifically mentioned you know your your goal you really wanted to get back to the stage so i'm curious you know with all of the work that came in between how did that affect who you became as a as a stage performer? How did how did the the sort of time in between working on film and TV sort of change and change the DNA and the? I couldn't get a job before. It's the, that's the irony. It's like <laughs> I had to become like a film and TV star in order to book acting work, and that is a very sad thing in many ways because I know there are some incredible people out there who are not film and TV stars, who are great theater actors. And this is not to knock my own work because I do believe very much in myself as a theater actor. I feel very comfortable on stage. And I I know that it's in my blood, even if the world at large does not know. But it is true that there are some times where you can be a big TV star and get a role where somebody who is a great theater actor can't get that role. And of course, it all has to do with money, right? At the end of the day, they need audiences and... TV has a wide reach and reaches more audiences. So tourists will come see the show, blah, blah, blah. And in that way, it also does serve the other actors and the crew on the show because then their show has more longevity, et cetera. But it's true that I I, I tried to be a theater actor for 10 years in New York. And the only reason I moved to LA was because I had my heart broken by an actor, New York actor. Um, (laughs) And I wasn't really thinking. Um, And then I had to pay my bills. So doing TV and film was a much quicker way of paying off your student debt than doing theater. And then once my show was finally, my TV show was finally over, fresh off the boat, that was when I sort of had time to pursue theater work. But then the pandemic happened because I Mm -hmm. finished my last episode of Fresh Off the Boat in the middle of December of 2019 got pregnant a few weeks later, then the pandemic happened, had a baby in the pandemic. Then, uh, and I I think I just also finished, did I think, no, Hustlers had come out. Oh, and then I did another movie. I did Lyle Lyle Crocodile. But yeah, so a lot has happened since then because with the pandemic and with having two children, you know, it's definitely been an adjustment. Are you an actor stepping onto a film or TV set with butterflies in your stomach, unsure of how the industry's gears turn? We've all been there. That nerve-wracking moment when you're the new face on set, clueless about the behind-the-scenes magic. 
But fear not, because there's a podcast that's your backstage pass to the inner workings of the film and TV industry. Welcome to Soundstage Insider, the podcast that demystifies the enigmatic world of Hollywood one episode at a time. Join us as we pull back the curtain and reveal the secrets of film and television, diving deep into the industry's inner workings, demystifying the jargon, and gaining a backstage view of how iconic projects come to life. I talk with talent from Star Wars, Breaking Bad, Only Murders in the Building, Ted Lasso, Bridgerton, Avengers, and so many more incredible productions. Subscribe to Soundstage Insider right now and let us be your guide to navigating the sometimes mystifying world of showbiz. Soundstage Insider is available wherever you get your podcasts. So how did Little Shop come to be? I think you mentioned that you you, you first saw Little Shop of Horrors years and years ago, a community production in mm -hmm. Richmond, Virginia. Um, what sparked for you, the play, and then, you know, sort of how did it come to be that you are now in it? Well, when I first saw it, when I was a kid, I was maybe 10, 11, 12, something like that, I loved it. I was so transfixed. I thought the music was so great. It was so funny. But then, even as a kid, I was like, oh my God, this has such deeper themes of like greed and capitalism and like the American dream, but it doesn't force feed them to you. Like it's, also just a really funny show with a lot of heart. So I loved it then and I I actually didn't even see the movie until I was in college. I was always a fan of the, the play first, the stage play. And then, you know, I think it's actually pretty well documented that Audrey has been my dream role for a long time. Even before this production was off Broadway, I think I was on some talk show, it might've been Fallon or something where I'm like, my dream role is to play Audrey in Little Shop of Horrors because it really has been. I um, I, te I tested for the, the remake of the movie of Little Shop and was devastated when I didn't get it, devastated. But then the move, that movie got shelved actually as many Hollywood projects do. And, you know, so if, anyway, my team, everybody knew how into it I was because of how devastated I was when I didn't get the movie, because of how I had been talking about it on other talk shows. I had met with Jim Carnahan, who's the casting director, a few years prior, just to say, as a general meeting, saying, hey, I'm like really interested in doing theater. I know you do a lot of theater casting, so I just want to put my name out there. And so when the opportunity came up, I was friggin thrilled i'm still thrilled right now like it's so fun it's everything i ever wanted and that's the, and now now i'm doing it i'm curious you know if when when it's your dream role for that long obviously you have to think like oh here's how i would play it if i happen to get that role you know that's had to have been bouncing yeah. around your head for years and years and years how much does that carry over to when you are then actually asked to play that role does it does it does was was what you thought you would do what you're doing or does it, has that changed? No, I mean, I always thought that, you know, the best comedy comes from truthfulness. So I was always like, it has to really be truthful. But I don't, even though I had ideas, I never like to set anything in stone because then it's just not alive. Michael, the director, well, at first, though, so I only had like six rehearsals. So at first I was really playing the comedy mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm pretty good at the the comedy. And then Michael wanted me to really play into the um, the domestic abuse aspect of it and sort of the trauma and the despair of Audrey rather than playing her as like the funny, ditzy, squeaky girl. And I was like, that's interesting. I like that. That's very in line with my values as an artist. Let me try it. So I tried that because he gave me that note after the put in. So on my first night, I tried that. And then it was, it lost a little something for me. So then the journey for that first week of performances was how do I find the humor, the heart, and the, the tragedy, the depth, without watering any of those elements down? And I was, and I just played around with the character for the whole first week. And I sort of let Audrey surprise me. And she did. And I think I've... I think I found I found it, but it it was just I had to try that one show where I w went really dark, 
And that didn't work. I had to try shows where I only play the comedy. That didn't work either. Just like I had to try that one show where I did it in a lower key. Didn't work. But <laughs> you try that and you learn things from it. This is why people have previews. I'm a replacement, obviously, so I didn't technically have previews. But um, that's what's been fun about it. I did have a note at the very beginning before I even started rehearsals where I said to Michael, like, does she have to have the New York accent? Like, I, I'm not, like, totally against it. But might it be interesting to just not do that, to try something different with it? But he was very much like, she doesn't have to have a super strong one, but she's got to have a New York accent. I mean, like, this is a beloved show. There are certain things you have to hit. And so when he said that, I was like, absolutely great. I could find, I could find that. But I was like, oh, what are some things we could play with without being married to any of them? That was one of the things he did not want me to play with was the New York accent. So uh, we kept that. Yeah, it's 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 ever evolving. And that's what's fun about theater. It's like, oh, that didn't that key didn't work. Let's try it a different way the next night. And then um, and you keep figuring it out. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, finding those things as the show goes on? Like so when you have the way you're playing it on opening night, when you think about that and then you think about where you're going to be on your last performance, what is the goal for you? Like, what are you what are you trying to get to? Like, does it almost feel like you're going to perfect the character no there's no such there's no such thing as perfection but i think freedom i think more and more freedom is sort of the goal freedom to play and be funny freedom to go deep and go dark freedom to adjust as things change like if i'm playing with a different with an understudy for Orin or an understudy for seymour or the audience has a different vibe i mean you you have to kind of be fluid with that. Um, I hope I don't get to the point where something feels like this is perfect and this is how you play it because I, mm. I just don't think that's, uh, I think that's like an illusion and I don't think that's very sustainable either. But I don't know. Who knows? Ask me when I'm done with the run. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I was just talking, uh, we, we just interviewed Martin Short and he, he said something very interesting. You know, people always say in the in the beginning of the show, they say, wow, you did so great. And the theater actor always thinks like, come see me at the end. I'll have figured it. I'll have, I'll have. It'll evolve. Yeah. Worked out the kinks. Yes, exactly. And that is the beauty. That is the beauty of theater. I do think I saw you mention that uh, call back in the morning, the Yak 2 opener was a particular challenge. It would have been less of a challenge if I had had more rehearsal weeks. I I was I had COVID my first week of rehearsal, so I couldn't rehearse. They wouldn't let me. Oh. But just because the choreography of the phones, of which phone to pick up when, not even the choreography dancing, but just like choreography of what phone to pick up when and when to hang up and which phone to put on hold and which phone to hang up and which, when to go to that table while you're singing. Technically, I didn't have to be perfect on that because nobody's really going to know. But if I'm so in my head about it that I can't be free enough to actually be in the character because I'm thinking about choreography, um, that's that's no good, right? So I wanted it to be so in my bones that I was again had the freedom to play, and I think I'm, I think I'm there with the phones, but it's. You know, even naming the yes, ma'am, nice delphiniums, geraniums, forsythia, japonica, wisteria, you name it, we sell it. And like remembering all those flowers in exactly that order <laughs> on which phone? Yes, camellias, magnolias, hepaticas, and gorgeous gladiolas. And I said those all exactly as they're supposed to be said. Wonderful. But, you know, nobody would notice because it's like a cacophony of words, but. Um, but I wouldn't be free enough to do my best if I'm thinking about the lines. So, so that's why it was a challenge for me. But I think I'm there now. And just you saying that it brings to mind uh, one of the many things that I, that I, again, can't comprehend about theater because it's so impressive. How in the moment do you sort of get those little hiccups that the audience wouldn't even notice, but you're sort of just trip over something? How do you just keep going? How do you how do you sort of um, learn to to not dwell on something you know is a mistake? Oh, I never dwell on a mistake. You just keep going. I mean, it's already happened. L just like little things. Like I think oh, at one point I'm like singing downtown and I crossed this cinder block and um, the dustpan that was on it 
fell off because I, I like hit it with my leg. I just kept singing and I picked it up and I put it back on. You know, there was another time where Seymour accidentally kicked a magnifying lens um, across the stage during callback in the morning. And I knew that Mr. Mushnick had to use that in the next scene. So in my line was like, my next line was like, Seymour, do you mind closing up for me? I, you know, I'm, I'm all in. And during that line, I just went over and I picked it up and I put it back in place the way you would if you were working in a shop and something fell, you'd go pick it up. I, I don't know. I don't get even my opening night, like my heart rate was very tame. I don't get nervous. In fact, I actually feel like I'm more nervous in real life than I am on stage because it's like you go. Yeah. So what if something drops? So what if something that's life? That's actually one of the most fun parts. There was this really fun performance of 222 where I actually did something that many people would probably think was very unprofessional, but I think the audience really appreciated <laughs> it. There was this one show where um, my character like basically says she doesn't she wants to divorce her husband. And the audience was so into it. And some guy in like the fifth row said so loud when I said that, he goes, oh man, oh no. And it was, it was so vocal that the whole audience started laughing at him, <laughs> right? Even though it was a very serious part of the show. And the whole audience started laughing at his reaction that I sort of just couldn't ignore it. So I just turned to him and I smiled and I started laughing. And the audience loved that I acknowledged what they were all acknowledging. And then dear Finn, who played my husband, was the utter, utter professional, completely <laughs> in character. Whereas I totally like, I gave a little nod to the audience. And I think the casting director that was there that day and they were like, that was the best part of the show. Because that's something nobody else got. And we all shared because you couldn't ignore it because everybody else was laughing at that guy. It made me laugh. So I had to turn to him and I turned to him. We had our moment, the audience. We all shared that moment. We all were laughing and appreciating it. I took a breath and I went back into the scene and then the audience went with me. They went back into the show. This is why AI cannot replace stage acting. Because it's a little <laughs> moments like this. And if you, as long as you go with it and you're not too married to how something is, has to be, um, that's when moments like that could happen. Whether it's a dustpan falling on accident or a very vocal audience member that becomes a part of the show. I think that's what people, you know, when, when we speak about the aliveness of theater, you know, like there are things that happen in some performances that will never happen yeah. in any of the other performances. You just saw somebody live <laughs> something. That will not be in the next. In the yeah, next, and I really think next. that audience, like, if you ask anyone, I'm sure they remember that show because it was just like <laughs> it was such a moment of like synchronicity between an audience and a performer. It was so great and on pressure. I'm not I'm I unprofessional of me, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked. worked. It worked. If it, it works, worked. it's professional. Um, so when you, you know, when you sort of take stock of of this show where you are right now doing Little Shop, and you look back at some of those those earlier theater performances, you know, the, the the things we discussed, the other things you discussed as a New York actor or in school or whatever. In in what ways are you, do you think you're the same performer now? Um, I'm the same performer in that I have the same tools. My tools might be a little bit more used in a good way. <laughs> they might be a little more broken in at this point, but I think I am better at exercising a bit more restraint in terms of using the tools, those tools. And I think I'm less attached to results or critiques than I was when I was younger. And I think that's just something that comes with age. Um, and as a result, I think I'm a better performer because of that. Um, because it's not about, again, ego. It's not about getting good marks, getting good reviews. Um, and once you get that stuff out of the way, then you're you're able to get out of your own way and then you could access the character a little bit better. But, but the, 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 the feelings and the understanding of humanity and the appreciation for what it means and the love for it is, has always been consistent. It's just been a long journey of getting out of my own way. Um, and that's, you know, why conservatory wasn't great for me because it really put me in my head and being in your head is another way that you get, you sort of get in your own way. So getting out of your own way um, to use those same very essential 
tools that anybody with a soul has is sort of what I think I have evolved more with. But that's why, you know, little kid actors are so good because they have those tools. They're the same tools. They're the tools of play and feeling. Um, and they're not, little kids aren't getting in their own way as much. They're like, oh, they're just, they, they just agree. We're playing make-believe. My daughter will find like a block in the floor and she's like, this is a cake. And we just agree. And we don't have to think about it so much. That's why kids are great at it. And, you know, it's all the stuff that happens in adolescence and young adulthood that sort of gets you in your head. And you have to sort of unlearn those things and go back to childhood play in many ways. I love that. As we sort of wrap up here, I, I do just want to ask generally, you know, in a time where film, tele film and television acting, and it's all very uncertain, the whole industry is very uncertain. A lot of people that listen to this podcast are very uh, early career, yeah. aspiring actors, sort of finding their way forward. What do you think is the most valuable thing about trying acting for the stage? What 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 does that add to your toolbox or your career that that is the most valuable for anyone who wants to be an actor and try acting? To be honest, I don't think it's for everyone. I, there are some film actors who I don't think belong on the stage and that's not me denigrating their work at all it's just it's just a, a fit thing you know if you only want to do film and tv then only do film and tv <laughs> like there's nothing wrong with that if there is one thing that i think it would help a film and tv actor with it is um discipline because i know a lot of film and tv actors who show up and they barely know their lines and, but they have tremendous talent and they be, can be incredibly live in the moment. And, and once they get that one performance on film, they don't have to ever do it again. Not so with theater. You have to do eight shows a week. So you're not going to have always that magic that, that, that you might have had on that one day of filming. And I think the discipline of finding the tools to still have a great performance, even if it's not a magical day that just comes from discipline and integrity. And that um, is a skill that it's, there's not really a cheat sheet for. You just sort of have to, you can't, you can't do theater and show up and not know your lines. That's, you can't do that. You can show up without knowing your lines on a film and TV set, because if you fuck up your lines, they just don't use that cut easy, right? Um, you, you can't do that in theater. So the discipline aspect of it um, is definitely helpful. Amazing. Constance, this, this 45 minutes <laughs> blew by. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm so thrilled that you're doing Little Shop. Um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I, it's incredible that you're doing it, and I can't wait to see what goes next. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And um, yeah, I hope you get to come see the show. Thanks, as always, to our brilliant producer, Jamie Muffet, and to the whole team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage with code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. 100% free, you simply cannot beat that. For more exclusive content, find us on Facebook and Twitter, at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who should we interview next? Let us know. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another peek in the envelope.